Welcome to our video collaboration. In this video, we will be able to distinguish between client server and peer-to-peer -peer networks, list network devices, and the specific uses for a network, and basically understanding the OSI model. And lastly, I'll be guiding you on how to troubleshoot network issues that will be very beneficial when it comes to your work. Our videos will be separated into two parts. The first part will be introduction to networking and the second part is all about troubleshooting scenarios. I believe you are familiar with the term topology, but do you know the difference between the physical and the logical topology? You need to understand that topology describes how the parts of a whole network work together. When studying networking, you need to understand both the physical topology and the logical topology of a network. Let's go first with the physical topology. Physical topology illustrates the physical location of the devices and cable installation. See in this figure that the location of the devices and where it is located is all documented, while the logical topology illustrates the devices, ports, and the IP addressing of the network. The term physical topology refers to a network hardware and how devices and cable fits together, while the logical topology refers to the way software controls access to the network resources and how those resources are shared on the network. Computers can be positioned on a network in a different ways relative to each other. They can have a different levels of control over shared resources. They can also be made to communicate and share resources according to different setup. Okay, the following sections describe two fundamental network models, which is peer-to-peer -peer and client-server model. Mostly, it is the devices in a peer-to-peer -peer network can share resources through different techniques of file sharing or user accounts. The disadvantage of using P2P network is that it is not scalable as the network grows larger and most importantly, it is not necessarily secure. Data and other resources are shared by other users and can be easily used by unauthorized users. Next on the topic would be the client-server network model. A centralized database manages shared resources in the client-server network model. A centralized database stored all the network information. Uh, one of the best examples of this is a Active Directory. Active Directory is a database and set up services that connects users with the network resources they need to get their work done. The database or the directory contains critical information about your environment, including what users and computers they are and who's allowed to do what. You have learned that the networks, no matter how simple or complex, it is needed that you must be familiar with the network devices. Knowing the function of these devices would definitely help you when it comes to troubleshooting. Let's start off this discussion of networking hardware with the network shown here. Keep in mind that every node on a network needs a network address so that other nodes can find it. We have routers, switches, firewalls, access points, servers, endpoints, and other appliances that may be needed in your environment. We can discuss few devices in the slide. First is router. These devices connect networks and intelligently choose the best path between networks. Their main function is to route traffic from one network to another. I'm not sure if there are still hubs that are being used right now, but I highly suggest to use switch instead of a hub, as hub only accepts signals from a transmitting device and just repeat those signals to other connected devices in a broadcast fashion. On today's network, Ethernet's network, switches have now replaced hub. So generally, the traffic is greatly reduced with switches because when a switch receives a transmission from a device, switch sends it only to the destination devices rather than broadcasting to all devices connected to the switch. Switches have 
a two kinds we have two kinds of switches and manage and also manage switch an unmanaged switch provides plug and play simplicity with minimal configuration options and has no IP address assigned to it. Unmanaged switches are not very expensive but their capabilities are very limited. While managed switches on the other hand can be configured via a command line interface or a web based management such as GUI. Next would be firewall. A firewall is a specialized device or software that selectively filters or black traffic between networks. A firewall protects a network by blocking certain traffic towards a firewall's position. Remember, firewall includes filtering from ACLs. They also offer a wide variety of other methods to evaluate, filter, and control network traffic. Welcome to Network Academy. We will continue our discussion with the types of area network. The fundamental difference between a switch and a router is that a switch belongs only to its local network and a router belongs to two or more networks. The router acts as a gateway between multiple networks, but a switch, even if there are multiple switches, can only communicate within a single network. Recall that a nodes on a local network communicate directly with one another. However, a node on one LAN cannot communicate with a node on another LAN without a router to manage that communication and to stand as a gateway between the networks. Routers are often referred to as a gateway devices or just gateways. Now that you understand the basic functions of switches and routers, you're ready to make the distinction between the two terms host and node. A host is any endpoint device such as computer or printer connected to a network that hosts or accesses a resource such as an application or data. So far you've learned about local area networks. What about the network outside the local network? Let's look at the other types of networks which primarily vary according to the geographic space and the specific connection technologies they use. A group of local area network that spread over a wide geographical area is called wide area network. A group of connected lands in the same geographical area, for example, a government office surrounding a state capital building is known as a metropolitan area network or campus area network. Although in reality, you won't often see those terms used or they might be used simultaneously. The network functions are separated into seven categories in the OSI reference model. This separation of networking functions is called layering. The OSI reference model has a seven numbered layers, each illustrating a specific network function. We will discuss each of these layers and their functions. The layers are as follows, physical, data, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. Layer 1, the physical layer. It is responsible for sending bits via wired or wireless transmission. These bits can be transmitted as a wavelength in the air, for example, Wi-Fi, while for the wired connection, it can be a voltage on a copper wire, for example, Ethernet on twisted pair cabling or light, which you can be seen on a fiber optic cabling. Layer 2 and 1 are responsible for interfacing with the physical hardware on a local network. The protocols at these layers are programmed into the firmware of a computer's network interface card and other networking hardware. Layer 2, the data link layer, is commonly called the link layer. The type of networking hardware or technology used on a network determines the data link protocol used. Examples of the data link protocols are Ethernet and Wi-Fi. The network layer, sometimes called the internet layer, is responsible for moving messages from one node to another until they reach the destination host. This is the layer where routers typically function. 
The principal network used by the network layer is IP, which is internet protocol. IP adds its own network layer header to the segment or datagram, and the entire network layer message is now called a packet. The network layer header identifies the sending and receiving hosts by their IP addresses. An IP address is an address assigned to each node on a network, which the network layer uses to uniquely identify them across multiple networks. Layer 4, the transport layer. It is responsible for transporting application layer payloads from one application to another. The two main transport layer protocols are the TCP and UDP. The session layer of the OSI model describes how data between the applications is synced and recovered if messages don't arrive intact at the receiving application. In the OSI model, the presentation layer is responsible for reformatting, compressing, or encrypting data in a way that the application on the receiving end can read. The application layer in the OSI model does not contain applications themselves such as web browser but instead it describes the interface between two applications. The application, presentation, and session layers are so intertwined that in practice it's often difficult to distinguish between them. Also, tasks for each layer may be performed by the operating system or the application. How often have you heard the complaint that I can't get on the network or the network is slow? This description of the problem, they're not very helpful because they're not very specific. Everyone has a different approach of solving problems, but we can all agree that the best method is to have a clear definition of the problem before you start. Unfortunately, the end users may not always be very detailed with the description of the problem. Is it a consistent problem? Is it intermittent? Is it isolated to one user? Or is it occurring to multiple users? Maybe it only appears at a certain times of the day or the issue cannot be duplicated. So this means before you start troubleshooting, you need to ask all the necessary questions to clearly define the problem. You need to remember that troubleshooting doesn't have any right or wrong procedure, yet it works best with the logical methodology. You need to clearly define the problem, understand any possible triggers, and know the expected behavior. The top-down approach is also the most straightforward troubleshooting approaches because the problems that user reports are usually defined as the application problem. Starting the troubleshooting process at the layer is a natural thing to do. You usually choose the top-down approach when you believe that the problem is most likely at the application or the other upper OSI layers. The common reasons for believing that the reported problems are related to users, applications, or at least upper OSI layers include the following. First, it comes from past experiences, new software applications, changes in the user interface, and also added security features. The top-down troubleshooting approach is usually most suitable for problems that one person or only few people experience because lower layer uh, that is actually the network infrastructure problems usually affect more than one person. The bottom-up approach starts from the physical layer of the OSI model and it works its way up on the application layer. This method is affected if the problem is located in the network infrastructure because of most of the networking problems occur in the lower layers of the protocol stack. The troubleshooting of bottom-up approach is starting with the physical components of the network and works through the layers of the OSI model. If you conclude that all the elements that associate with the particular layers are in good working condition, then you need to inspect the elements that associate with the next layer up. You need to continue this process until you identify the causes of the problem. Your goal is to eliminate more potential problem causes so that you can narrow the scope of the potential problems. Next would be the divide and conquer. This troubleshooting approach is a compromise between bottom up and top down troubleshooting. 
you need to start in the middle. That's why it's divide and conquer. Such as the network layer performing a ping and then doing a trace route and then based on the success, you can work your way either up or down in the protocol stack. The last one, the troubleshooting method would be the follow the path approach. Basically, you will just follow the path that the traffic should be taken through the network to get to the destination. This way, you could eliminate the alternate path and focus on the primary one while troubleshooting links that are irrelevant to the problem. The method that you choose, either bottom up, top down, or follow the path will depend on the questions you ask and also what are the users are reporting as a problem. This approach can quickly lead you to a problem area. You can try to pinpoint the problem to a device or any particular physical or logical components that either broken or misconfigured or has any bug. I hope you learned a lot on our discussion from the part 1 and part 2. And that concludes the introduction to networking. Again, thanks for watching.